In the year 2126, people are engrossed in a hyper-realistic MMORPG game called A Drizzle. Unfortunately, the game is nearing its end, causing most players to gradually leave. Ains, the leader of the notorious guild Ainswool Gown and a high-ranking player, decides to stay along with his teammate Harrow Harrow, who looks like a blobfish. Ains, a big fan of the game, feels disheartened that the game is finally concluding despite the immense fun and joy it has brought him. After a brief conversation, Harrow Harrow tells Ains to get a life and also logs out of the game, leaving him as the sole remaining member of the once unbeatable guild of 41 players. He gets up and grabs onto a magical staff, which was the most powerful weapon in all of the kingdom, and was created by the entire guild, by finding the strongest magical items known to men and assembling them into one overpowered weapon. He walks over to the hallway and finds all of the NPCs lined up waiting for his orders. He speaks a specific command that the NPCs can register and ask them to follow him. They follow him to the throne room, where he walks up to the throne to find an insanely beautiful woman called Alb. She stands there motionless while he sits down on the throne and decides that he is going to run out the clock as he has to go back to his depressive life anyway. He decides to have some fun in his last moments and opens the character settings of Mommy Milkers before changing the last setting to make her fall in love with him. He then tells them to bow down on the side for absolutely no reason and closes his eyes as the clock runs out. To his surprise, however, the clock starts running from zero once again, and when he opens his eyes, he sees that he is still in the game. Confused, he tries calling the administrator inside the game, but his call won't connect. He gets scared and starts messaging his guild member, but he fails to do so. He quickly starts looking for the log out button, but none of the settings options that he had just a couple of minutes earlier exist anymore. He starts panicking and shouts out for help, when Alb looks at him and asks him whether she could help with anything. This shocks him, as NPCs aren't supposed to talk or do anything unless and until they are given a specific command. He notices that even her mouth is moving, which is very weird, because usually the NPCs just sit there emotionless, and their voices are heard without them moving, but now Alb looks more and more like a real woman rather than the 2D girl that he used to dirty his socks for. He leaves his staff in the air to see whether it is working as it used to and realizes that it works the same. But then why are the NPCs acting weird? He looks at the butler, whose name is Seb, and asks him to go out to get some milk, but commands him to come back unlike his father. Seb promises that he will return shortly with milk and leaves while he tells another maid to go over to the kitchen and make him a sandwich, and she quickly scurries off inside the kitchen where she belongs. He then tells Alb to come near him and takes in a big whiff, only to be surprised at the fact that he can actually smell the sweet scent of her skin. He is pretty taken aback as the NPCs shouldn't smell like anything and asks her to come forward and grabs her wrist, feeling very happy, as this is the first time he has ever touched a girl, even though she is supposed to be an NPC. He suddenly realizes that she also has a pulse, which is a big shock for him. He tells her that she needs to gather all of the guardians guarding the different floors of this tomb and bring them to the main arena, where he wants to meet them. She gets up and walks off to do so without another word. He gets up and makes his way up to the arena, where suddenly, a young non-binary person jumps inside the ring and runs up to him. She introduces herself as Aura and is one of the guardians, alongside her sister Mare. Mare, however, is nowhere to be seen, so Aura starts shouting at her to show herself, as she seems to be a bit shy. Mare descends from the balcony and runs up to him as well, greeting him and immediately being shocked by how big his staff is. Ains tells them that size doesn't matter before starting to boast about how amazing his staff is and how many people have already played with him before, but only he can bring forth the true power of his staff. He then tells the twins to get a bunch of targets as he wants to practice some magic. Ains tries to maintain a facade of authority, but in reality, he doesn't know how to use his skills anymore because there are no buttons to do so. The twins bring a bunch of dummy targets and he goes on to use fire magic on them, completely burning them before the fire takes the shape of a giant fire demon. He realizes that even though the way magic is used is not as simple as before, he still seems to have retained the knowledge and strength to cast really strong spells. He looks at Aura looking at the fire demon with a watery mouth and asks her whether she wants to fight it. She immediately agrees and summons her whip before going all out on the demon. The demon tries to hold them back, but with the combined strength of both Mare and Aura, it is totally powerless. While they were fighting, Ains' insecurity gets the better of him, and he calls Seb up, asking whether he got the milk or not. Seb tells him that he can only find soy milk, but Ains tells him that it's okay, and calls him back quickly to prevent him from leaving him. 
The twins come back from their battle, and he pulls a jug of water from his ass and gives it to them. In the arena, the floor guardians of Mazarek make their grand entrance, introducing themselves individually. First comes Shaltier Bloodfallen, the guardian of the first, second, and third floors, an authentic vampire. Following her is Kassidus, the guardian of the fifth floor, whom Ainsvit describes as an excellent warrior. Demurge, the guardian of the seventh floor, and a genuine demon, steps forward next. Lastly, Albedo, the overseer of the four guardians, presents herself. To assert his dominance in the presence of these formidable beings, Ainsvit proceeds to have each one of them pledge their loyalty to him, one by one, and because he has never heard someone praise him, he asks all of them to tell him how they feel about him, while getting excited to hear good things. After he is done hearing the praise, he tells them that something weird has been going on, and that he has sent Seb to check on what's happening. Thankfully, Seb returns to him without any milk, but at least he comes back. He explains to Ains that there is no supermarket nearby as the entire tomb has been transported into some grasslands, with nothing of note around. This confuses Ains, but he decides to deal with it later. According to him, the first priority is to make sure that the tomb's defenses are solid. He asks Mare, who I just came to know is not a girl, but Trap, so that is what we will call her. He asks him whether there is any way they could hide the tomb, to which he replies that they can cover the entire tomb with dirt, which will make it look like a hill or something. Ains thinks about it for a moment, but Seb explains that this would be difficult because there are no hills nearby, which will make the tomb stand out even more. Ains asks them whether there is a way to create several small hills around the area and then cover the tomb with dirt, which will then conceal their location, and the trap replies that it is possible. He tells them to get back to work, strengthening their defenses, while he takes some rest. He teleports to a different part of the castle, from where he enters his bedchamber and tries to grab a sword and swing it. Surprisingly, the sword simply fell out of his hands, which means that the rules of the game are still applying on them. He is a mage, which means that he cannot equip a weapon that belongs to the warrior class. Ains, however, is a very crafty guy and magically creates armor, which temporarily changes his class to warrior, let him equip the sword. He tells the maid that he is going outside for some air, but the maid pleads with him to take someone with him. He tells her that he needs to go alone as he wants to check up on something and leaves the room. He goes on the floor above, where he is suddenly surrounded by a bunch of demons, scaring him. Thankfully, Dem is nearby and he quickly bows in front of him before asking why he is roaming around without guards. He tells them that he wants to go alone, but Dem refuses to move as he cannot let him go unguarded. Ains finally gives in and tells him that he doesn't want an entire unit of guards and that he will only be accompanied by one other person. Dem tells him that he wants to accompany him, and they start walking. He walks out to the balcony, which he probably has never done in real life, and takes in the gorgeous view of the night sky, glittering the stars all over. He summons a special locket, which gives him the ability to fly and takes it into the air, closely followed by Dem, who transforms into a frog monster and gets some wings so he can fly because everyone knows frogs can fly. He flies over the clouds and simply stares at the moon before taking his mask off. He tells Dem that he has never done any of this before and wants to live his life to the fullest at this time. He suddenly hears some commotion and looks down to see the trap piling the entire tomb walls with dirt everywhere. He descends down to him and he quickly comes running up to him, asking whether he did anything wrong. Ains looks up to him and tells him that he is doing a magnificent work, and to show that he appreciates his work, he produces a ring out of his ass and hands it over to the trap. The trap tells him that he cannot accept such an invaluable gift, as it was previously worn by the other guild members of the tomb, but Ains tells him that it is a gift recognizing his good work. He gets extremely happy, when suddenly, Mommy Milkers arrives on the scene with both of her big personalities. Ains suddenly realizes that he has altered her settings to make her love him the most, and if he only gives the trap a gift, she will go berserk and out of control because of jealousy. It sounds like every ex that I ever had. He quickly produces another ring out of his ass and gives it to her, saying that she is the leader of the four guardians, so she deserves the ring more than anyone else. But then he realizes that he will have to give one ring to Dem as well, but his ass is tired, so he promises to give him a ring another time before teleporting away. The next day, Ains spends most of his time playing with a mirror, which shows him the CCTV footage from the area. What a perv. He is looked down upon by Seb, but Ains reassures him that this is just for research purposes and he isn't going to do anything creepy with it. According to him, they can gain a better understanding of this new world, where they got Aizuke to. He seems to be mad that he didn't even get to meet Truck Kun, but suddenly he spots a bunch of small spots running around. He quickly zooms in to see a bunch of villagers running around their houses, while being chased by a bunch of armored knights. He keeps watching as the knights slaughter the villagers without discriminating between men, women, or children, 
chasing everyone down, kicking down their doors, driving them out, and killing them all. Seb reminds him that he is not watching Game of Thrones and tells him that they ought to do something, but Ains replies that they have no reason to interfere with these events as they stand nothing to gain from them. Steb simply backs off from the conversation, but suddenly Ains remembers an event from his past when he first joined the game. He got surrounded by a bunch of other people and was getting bullied all on the floor. Just as the bullies were about to kill him, a Mecha Knight jumped out of the bushes and attacked the bullies, killing them all. Ains looks up at him and asks him why he saved him, to which the knight replies that he believes it is his duty to protect anyone who is in trouble, and tells Ains that if he wants to repay him, simply help other people when they are in need of his help. This brings some new motivation inside of him, and he tells Seb that he is going to the village and tells him to ask Alb to follow him fully armed. Steb suspects that Ains is bipolar, but agrees to his plans regardless. He quickly teleports into the village right in front of two girls who are about to be killed by the knights. They stop as soon as they see him and are about to run back, when Ains simply used his magic to crush the heart of one of the knights. The girls get extremely scared and close their eyes while the other knight tries to run away. Ains, however, isn't done with them and uses a very lower level electric magic on him, shocking him to death immediately, realizing that he is extremely overpowered here. He uses one of his undead skills and converts one of the dead knights into a giant zombie knight, telling him to go and kill all the knights inside the village. As the zombie runs off in the distance, Alb arrives through a portal as well, fully dressed in her armor, and apologizes for the delay. She looks at the two girls and asks Ains whether he wants her to kill them as they are low-class humans, but Ains tells her to chill out for a bit. He bends down to the girls and offers them a vial of magic potion to heal the sword wound on one of them, but the girls are terrified after seeing his ghoulish face. All gets angry at this as all she wants is to lick that ghoulish face, but Ains again tells her to chill out and tries to offer the vial to the girl again, along with some kind words. The older sister takes the vial and drinks it, getting surprised when suddenly her wounds heal completely, she thanks him for his generosity, before asking if he's a mage. Ains tells her that he is, and she asks what's going on. She replies that suddenly these knights from a different kingdom entered their village and started destroying everything and killing everyone. He then uses his magic to create a magical barrier around the two girls, telling them that if they stay inside it, they will be safe. But if they go outside of the radius, then cannot keep them safe. He also gives them a bunch of horns, which he tells them to blow if they feel threatened, as it will all forth an army of goblins, who will listen to their commands and protect them. He then turns around and starts walking towards the village. Inside the village, the zombie knight has put all the enemy soldiers on the back foot, as they are unable to do anything against this massive monster. They try to attack him, but their swords shatter. If they try to run, the monster specifically chases them, before killing them mercilessly. The leader of the knights gets horrified and starts crying out for help, offering the fellow knights money if they can keep him safe. But as soon as he starts running away, he is killed by the zombie knight. One of the knights takes command and tells the others to fall back and he will distract the zombie. But his words are only words at the end as the zombie easily dispatches the knight before turning towards the next enemy. At that very moment, Ains arrives and orders the zombie to stop as he descends down from the air alongside Alp. This time he wears a mask as he doesn't want the villagers to get scared by his ugly mug. He tells the enemy soldiers that his name is Ains, and that he has taken these villagers under his protection. He tells them to run back to their kingdom, and to inform their leader that if they attack any villages again, Ains will destroy their entire kingdom. The knights are so terrified that they simply run away, as Ains turns around to address the villagers. He introduces himself and tells them that they are safe now, but notices that they all seem to be scared and suspicious of him, as why would a random stranger save a village for no reason? He quickly changes his story and tells them that he saved them to get money out of them, and nothing else. This satisfies the villagers, and the chief of the village invites him over to his house to talk. Ains is able to extract a lot of information from the village chief, and now knows that this continent has three major kingdoms that are all at war with one another. He also learns about the races of this country and realizes that the money from the game that he had doesn't work here. But thankfully, it is made up of gold, which could be sold for money. The chief also tells him that there is a town nearby which has an adventurer's guild, and that there are adventurers in this world who take money for killing all kind of monsters like goblins or orcs. The meeting finally ends and he looks over as all of the villagers mourn over their loved ones who died today, and Ains thinks about the fact that he can revive all of the dead people, if he wants to, but this might result in an even greater problem if people got to know what he is capable of. He walks back to the village when he sees a bunch of villagers surrounding the village chief. He asks them if there is a problem, and the chief replies that a bunch of armed men have been seen riding towards their village. Ains reassures them that till he is here, 
No one can harm them and waits in anticipation as the dust cloud clears and a bunch of knights appear on horseback. These knights, however, have a different sigil and are of this country itself. Ains greets the leader of the knights and informs them that he saved the village while it was getting attacked, and the knight immediately thanks him for his help. Before they can talk more, however, a knight runs up to the leader and informs him that a bunch of enemies are descending upon their village, and they need to get ready for a fight. Everyone retreats inside of the village town hall as the leader of the knights and Ains both look outside to see a bunch of magic users ready for an attack. While talking to Ains, the knight reveals that the enemies have someone from a world called Eidrassel, who is very strong and is able to use magic, as well as items that are unheard of. This piques Ains' interest and tries to inquire more, but the leader has no more info regarding that. Ains asks him, why are these knights trying to sack this village, to which the leader replies that it was all just a trap to capture him, as he is the strongest fighter in the army. He then looks at Ains and asks him whether he can be hired and will be repaid with money, but Ains refuses, saying that he isn't interested. The leader simply smiles, accepting his fate, but tells Ains to at least protect the villagers once he is dead. Ains gets moved by his selflessness and promises to protect the village no matter what, and before the leader could leave for battle, he handed him a small totem-like item as a lucky charm. The leader accepts it gracefully and leaves for battle alongside his troops, who are heavily outnumbered by the enemies. He tells them that the plan is to protect the village, so they will rush inside the battle and the leader will try to get as close to the commander of the mages as possible. By this time, the rest of the troops are instructed to fall back inside of the village and to protect it, leaving the leader alone to fight his battle. They rush into the battle on horseback, shooting arrows at the magic casters, but they are of no use, and the magic scares the horses and one of them throws the leader off. One of the flying monsters known as Angels attacks the leader but he is able to block its blow and push it back. The Angel, however, is completely unhurt, and the leader realizes that he needs to use all of his skills if he wants to even stand a chance. He channels his energy into his sword and lands such a quick slash that the Angel is cut cleanly in half. The victory is short-lived, however, as suddenly even more angels appear around him, surrounding him completely. He simply accepts his death and hopes that Ames will be able to save the villagers, but to his surprise, all of his troops, who were supposed to fall back and defend themselves, came rushing back into the battle, determined to protect their leader. A massive fight breaks out where the soldiers are trying to fight against the much stronger angels and dying left and right. They are at a huge disadvantage, which is recognized by the leader, who decides that he will finish the entire fight in a single decisive duel between him and the commander of the enemies. He spots him and rushes towards him, killing a bunch of angels all at once with his special ability. He is attacked by another group of angels, but he again emerges victorious after a successful counterattack. The enemy commander, who is totally bald, recognizes his strength but tells him that there is nothing he can do and summons another set of angels. Slowly but surely, his entire battalion falls, only he is left standing, bruised and battered, left alone to fight against a huge army of angels. They attack him once again from all directions, while he tries to defend against them, but they outnumber him and slowly start overpowering him, hitting him again and again and finally stabbing him in the stomach, after which he falls to the ground. The baldy tells his mages to attack him from all directions and finish him off, but the leader gets up on his toes again with a huge scream and tells them that the fight isn't over yet. Baldi tells him to admit his defeat as there is no way he can win against them, and there is no way he can protect the villagers now. After hearing this, the leader lets out a chuckle, saying that there is someone much stronger than him in the village, and he will never let anyone hurt the villagers. This surprises Baldi, who however decides to call it a bluff, and decides to land the final blow, but suddenly, the leader is transported back into the town hall alongside all of the other villagers. He asks them how he got here, but they are just as confused and tell him that suddenly, Ains and him switch places. He takes out the item that Ains gave him and realizes it was a teleportation item, and he always planned on saving him. On the other side of the battlefield, Baldi is surprised to see the sudden appearance of Ains and asks him who he is. Ains replies by saying that friends call him Ains and enemies call him Daddy. This, however, doesn't faze Baldi, who thinks Ains came to beg for mercy for the villagers. Ains, however, clarifies that he is here to destroy him, as he dared say that he will kill the villagers after Ains gave them his protection. He tells Baldi to calmly hand over his life to him, so that they can stop wasting each other's time, but Baldi immediately tells his angels to attack him. The angels rush towards Ains and stab him in the stomach, but to the enemy's surprise, they have no effect on Ains, who simply grabs their heads and slams them on the ground, killing them immediately. Ains, however, realizes that these angels are not from this world and were created by using the magic of the world of Eidrasil. 
Baldi gets horrified and tells all of the angels to attack him at one and Ains tells Alb to stand back as he uses one of his abilities which surrounds everything around him in a dark dome and destroys anything that came inside of it. All of the angels that attacked him got destroyed at once which scared the enemy so much that they started firing a bunch of magic attacks at him, hoping that it will hurt him, but Ains doesn't even bother to defend against them as they are so low level, he can't even feel them. He realizes that these magic spells are also from the world of Yggdrasil, and asks who taught them this magic. Suddenly, however, Alb jumps in and kills one of the enemies, scaring all of them. Ains tells him to back off, but she tells him that she was getting bored and wanted to do something. Baldi orders one of the chief angels to attack Ains and use its strongest attack, but Ains easily stops it with his hands and uses one of his fingers to create a small magical fire, which completely demolishes the angel in a single attack. He finally loses his cool and takes out a blue crystal from his pocket. Ains identifies the crystal as an item that conceals someone's magic, so he tells Alv to shield him, as she is a warrior. He however uses it to call forth a giant, beautiful-looking angel, which he seems to be very proud of, but Ains simply feels disappointed as he was actually expecting a good attack, and not another useless and weak angel. Baldi thinks that Ains is bluffing and tells the angel to use its strongest attack on them. The angel attacks them, but to his surprise, the attack does nothing, as both Alb and Ains are still standing their ground completely unfazed. Ains steps forward and creates a small black hole, which destroys the angel immediately in a single attack. This completely breaks the spirits of the enemies who drop down on their knees and start begging for forgiveness, but Ains decides that he isn't going to let such filthy creatures live and ends them all. He goes back to his tomb and announces to his underlings that from now on, he has decided that he is going to spread his name in this world. The next couple of days go by without much happening, as he keeps pondering over ways to craft friendship with one of the kingdoms, gain a lot of information, and find people from Yggdrasil, who might be stuck in this world as well. He tells Al that they need to maintain a good relationship with the village they rescued, as that is the only place where people would give him information. The next day, he leaves his tomb alongside his maid, Nade, who is also dressed as an adventurer. They leave for the city that the village chief was talking about and enter a dinghy inn after registering themselves at the local guild and gaining the copper rank, which is the lowest of them all. He gets a room for the two of them and while walking towards the room, one of the punks stuck their leg out and when his leg got touched by Ains while moving, he got up in his face, demanding that he pay for hurting him and started disrespecting them. Ames, however, wasn't in the mood for bullshit and grabbed him by the collar before picking him up and throwing him across the room. He then turns his attention to the other two friends of the punk, and asks them whether they want a piece of him. Before they could fight, however, a woman starts screaming and rushes up to Ains, telling him that he broke the vial of healing potion that he just bought when he threw that punk across the room. She tells him that he should pay for it, as she literally starved herself to buy that potion, and tells him to pay a gold piece and several silver pieces. Ains tells her to get her money from the punks, as they are the ones who created the problem, but she tells him that they don't have any money to even drink, that's why they haggle with newcomers for some petty change, so that they can have a drink. On the other hand, she claims that he is wearing really fancy armor, so he definitely has the money. Ains decides to take out a healing potion and hands it over to her. She gets surprised as healing potions are supposed to be blue in color and not red. Ains, however, cannot tell her that a pure healing potion is always red in color and only the potions that are impure are blue in color, as a pure healing potion is extremely difficult to create and is very expensive. He moves past her, and they enter their small room. Nave instantly remarks that he shouldn't be living in such filthy conditions, and that only rats and goblins live like this. I take that as a personal attack as I am neither a rat nor a goblin. She also isn't very happy that the low-life humans are talking so freely to him, and according to her, they should all be destroyed for doing that. He tells her to chill out for a bit, as women working under her always seem to be in a furious mood. He tells her that they need to seamlessly blend in for the time they are here, as they need more and more information about this world. The second problem that they have is that they are running short on money. They have a lot of gold from Yggdrasil, but people will get suspicious about it, so they need to pick up odd jobs to sustain themselves, for the time being. The next day, they head over to the guild and look for quests that they can take, but as they move towards the notice board, they realize that they aren't even able to read the language of this world properly. Confused, Ains simply rips one of the quest notices off the wall and takes it over to the counter for the receptionist to see. The receptionist looks at it and tells them that she cannot give them that quest as it is meant for diamond rank or above. Ains tells her that he wants that quest only, and that she shouldn't worry about their rank as they are experienced adventurers who just came into the town and are much stronger than what their rank shows. The receptionist is a very headstrong woman, however, and tells him to piss off and goes over to bring him some bronze rank quests that he might be able to do. 
During that time, a party of adventurers calls them over and asks them whether they would be willing to party up with them. They all go upstairs where the leader of their party says that they are going on a silver rank quest near the border of the city and would love to have some extra hands for help. Their group is made up of himself, the leader, who is named Pete, a simp, a fatty, and a kid. They all introduce themselves and start talking about the city. Ains tells them that he is new in the city and would like to know more. Pete tells him that the most famous adventurer in the city is Bao, who is the grandson of a very renowned pharmacist and is known for being able to use all kinds of elemental magic, even though you were just supposed to use one. They talk for some more time before deciding to start on their adventure the next day. While going downstairs, however, the receptionist calls him over and tells him that he has received a personal request for a quest. The entire party gets surprised, as personal requests are usually made only for very high-ranking players. Ains asks the receptionist who made the request, and she reveals that the request was made by Bao, who moves out from the crowd and looks like an average mushroom-cut guy. He greets Ains and tells him that he has a quest for him, but Ains straight up rejects him, saying that he has already agreed to a quest with another party. Pete tells him that he should probably accept Bao's request, as he is asking for Ains personally, but he refuses, and says that he doesn't back out on a promise that he already made. Pete, however, tells him to at least hear him out, so Ains decides to give the mushroom cut a chance. They all go inside a room and Bal introduces himself, before saying that he wants to go to the Karn village, which is the same village that Ains defended. According to him, he needs to gather some herbs which can be found in the village and the surrounding forest, and for that, he needs a bodyguard to protect him. Ains asks him why he requested it personally, to which Bal replies that he heard about the commotion in the inn, when he was easily able to defeat the adventurers that were higher level than him. According to him, the woman who he gave the potion to, came to his shop to get it checked, and that's where he heard the story, and apart from that, copper rank adventurers are cheaper to hire. Ains then tells him that he is willing to take on the job, but he will be joined by Pete and his group, to which the Mushroom Cut agrees as he has no problems with it. Mushroom Cut then tells them to get ready, as they will leave as soon as possible. They all leave for the village on the road and they make sure to be in a tight formation, with Bal in the middle and the other adventurers surrounding him from all sides. He asks Pete whether they can rest for a bit near a stream, so they all stop for a bit to water the horses and relax. Pete tells Ains that from now on, they will start encountering a bunch of monsters, so they need to be very careful about how they move and who they fight. Ains agrees to this and starts thinking about his strategy. Because he is currently wearing armor, he cannot use his magic skills and can only use a sword, but he trusts Nave that if anything happens, she should be able to deal with it with her own magic. The sim starts annoying Nave, who just wants to squash this mosquito, but is held back by Ains. The kid comments that this area is the territory of the wise king of the forest. Ains has never heard of this person, so he asked about him. The kid replies that it is a silver four-legged beast with a snake instead of a tail, who is very strong, wise, and can use a bunch of different magic spells. Ains talks to the kid some more, asking him more about the traditional magic that they perform as it seems to be a bit different than what he used to do in Egg Drizzle. A simp, on the other hand, keeps digging to get more information about Nobi, and asks her whether she and Ains are in a relationship, which she immediately declines, getting embarrassed. Ains gets pissed off and tells him to stop digging in his business, otherwise he will marry his mom. This shuts him up, but suddenly he points to Pete, that the enemies have been moving around them, and sure enough, a bunch of orcs and goblins emerge from the forest and start moving towards them. Pete tells the mushroom cut to stay hidden in the cart while they deal with this problem. They devise a plan and Ains tells them that they should all make sure to protect the mushroom boy, while he and Nabi will deal with the orcs and most of the monsters. Pete agrees to this arrangement, saying that they will try to help him wherever possible before turning around to his team to discuss their tactics. The sim starts shooting arrows at the enemies, while the kid uses his reinforcement magic on Pete. Fatty uses his ground magic to summon a thorny twine which grabs the legs of the enemies. Ames, on the other hand, simply walks towards the orcs, alongside Nave, before taking out two of his giant swords, which he then uses to slice an orc in half in a single blow. Everyone in his party is shocked to see him and Pete thinks that he is fighting at the level of at least the adamantite rank adventurers, who are the best of the best. Another orc runs towards him, and he is again easily able to dispatch it with a single swing of his sword. The enemy gets scared by this, and their formation breaks as they try to attack the weaker member of the party, like Pete. He, however, alongside his party, is able to hold his own as they all trust each other and have a great synergy. Ains realizes that he won't have to save them, so he simply moves forward and kills two more oncoming orcs with a single slash in his blade. Seeing this, the enemies finally decide to run away, but Ains sends Nabe to deal with them. Nab easily jumps forward and uses an electric spell to hit two of the orcs at once, killing them both while the rest of the party kills the remaining goblins. 
After the fight was over, they were healed by the fatty and Ames noticed that the kid was harvesting certain parts of the monsters. He asks him why he is doing so, to which he replies that these parts fetch a good sum, if you sell it to the guild. That night, they sit together around a bonfire to eat some food, but Ains excuses himself, as he cannot eat food in front of them because he is totally made up of skeletons. Nade follows him as they both stare into the twinkling night sky, waiting to see what will come the following day. The next day, they are finally able to reach Karn's village, but to their surprise, they find out that the village has been barricaded with a bunch of wooden fences. They move closer towards it, but suddenly spot a bunch of armored goblins, who shout at them to stop where they are, and suddenly, a bunch of goblins erupt from around them where they were hidden in the grass. The goblins tell them that they don't want any kind of fights as Ains is giving off a really strong and disturbing aura, and if they simply leave the village, they won't be hurt. This is very confusing, but suddenly, a girl arrives from inside the village and spots a mushroom boy in the cart. She tells the goblins to lay down their arms as these people are friends of the village. They go inside and the party asks her, why are these goblins defending the village, to which she replies that there was a mage who arrived inside the city one day when it was getting attacked. He saved both her and her sister before giving them a horn, which they can blow to call upon goblins, who will listen to everything she says. She is unable to recognize Ains as he is clad in armor this time, but Mushroom Boy realizes that she was talking about Ains and goes over to him, thanking him for saving the village. Ains tells him that the thanks isn't necessary before the party regroups, and they all decide to go inside the forest to collect the herbs that they require. While moving inside the forest, Mushroom Boy tells them that they might encounter the wise king of the forest, and if they encounter it, they should simply run away and not fight it. He begs Ains not to try and harm the beast, as it is the only reason why monsters stay away from the village and the nearby forests. Ains says that he cannot promise anything before moving forward in the forest alongside Nebi. He tells her that he wants to kill the beast, so that he can spread the name of Ains even more. Suddenly, he looks up and spots Aura, sitting on a tree branch. He asks her to find the beast and bring it to him, so that he can kill it, and Aura goes away to do his bidding. While searching for the herbs, the ground suddenly starts rumbling and the entire party gets scared of the arrival of the wise king. Ains tells all of them to move out of the forest as he will deal with it alone. They all go out, and once again, the mushroom boy asks him not to harm the beast before moving out. Ains gets ready for a fight as the beast approaches, and suddenly, from the trees, a tail attacks him. Ains is able to block the attack with his swords, when suddenly a booming voice commends his defense and says that if he is impressed, and if they both leave the forest immediately, he will not harm them. Ains makes fun of the beast and tells him to show himself, which the beast does, and he gets really disappointed. He was expecting the wise king to be a dangerous-looking creature, but it turns out he is just an oversized hamster. The hamster gets mad at him and tells him that he is really strong, but Ains simply uses his weakest aura at level 1 and flicks it towards the hamster, and just by that, the hamster drops on the floor, asking for mercy. He takes the hamster out and shows it to his party, saying that this is the formidable king of the forest. He tells them that he is going to register this creature at the guild, but Mushroom Boy asks him, who will protect the village then? Ains tells him not to worry, as he will personally make sure that the village is safe, and they make their way back to the town. Once they reach the town, they split up with Ains going alongside Nabe to the guild, and the rest of the party moving towards Bell's pharmacy to put the herbs back in place. Once he enters the shop, however, Bal notices that his grandmother is nowhere to be seen. He goes over to check her room when suddenly, he is met with a crazy-looking girl with a sword in her hand, asking him whether he is the famous magic caster that she is hearing about. 